Hello, today we're going to be talking about uh, nuclear binding energy, fission, fusion associated topics. Uh, this is in connection with Physics 30, Lesson 4.8.3. Now, curricular outcomes that are connected to this, a uh, general outcome, students will describe nuclear fission and fusion as powerful energy sources in nature. Uh, specific outcomes, compare and contrast the characteristics of fission and fusion reactions relate qualitatively and quantitatively the mass defect of the nucleus to the energy released in the nuclear reactions in, uh, using Einstein's concept of mass energy equivalence. Okay, so nuclear energy is very closely connected with the idea of binding energy. So binding energy is the amount of energy released when a nucleus is formed. Okay, so binding energy per nucleon generally increases from small atoms to atoms with mass number around 56, thus fusing small atoms to form medium-sized atoms, which is nuclear fusion, releases energy. Um, binding energy per nucleon generally decreases from atoms with a mass number around 56 to larger atoms, thus splitting atoms, large atoms, to form medium-sized atoms, uh, also releases energy, so that's nuclear fission. Okay, so note fusion, small atoms, the nucleus of small atoms being put together, and fission, the nucleus of large atoms being split. Okay, so binding energy is the net energy required to liberate all of the protons and neutrons in a nucleus, so overcome the strong nuclear force. Now, the binding energy you could say that uh, it equals the energy of the nucleons uh, minus the energy of the nucleus. Okay, um, so the energy per nucleon would be the energy of binding divided by the atomic mass number. Uh, now, unlike chemical reactions, the rates of nuclear reactions are unaffected by temperature pressure in the presence of other atoms to which the radioactive atom may be bonded. In nuclear reactions in general, they give off much more energy than chemical reactions. Uh, so whenever a nucleus undergoes some change, mass is converted to heat energy. Okay, so thanks to Einstein's theory of relativity, we find binding energy is equal to, uh, or is connected with the equation e equals mc squared. Okay, where E is the binding energy, uh, M is the mass defect, which is the difference between the mass of the individual nucleons and the mass of the nucleus, and C is the speed of light. And now let's have a look at an example problem. Find the mass defect uh, expressed in kilograms and the binding energy for a carbon-12 uh, nucleus. Okay, so what we know when we're told the carbon-12 nucleus that our mass is 12.0, um, the atomic number is 12, and uh, our, uh, let's see, well, atomic number is 6, and atomic mass is 12. Okay, so we're looking for the atomic uh, mass defect. Okay, so to, first of all, we're going to have to find the mass of the protons plus the mass of the neutrons minus the mass of the atom. Now, the protons and neutron values, um, if they're not given, uh, will be provided on the formula sheet. Okay, so protons, the mass in atomic units, is what we use here. Okay, and for neutrons, the, the mass in atomic units, we use that here. Okay, and the mass, uh, you know, atomic units of carbon-12 is 12. So we'll go 6 times the mass of the protons plus six times the mass of neutrons, and then minus 12, and we'll find out that there is a mass defect of 0 0.098940 atomic mass units. Okay, now we also will use the conversion factor for atomic mass units, and one atomic mass unit is 1.660539 times 10 to negative 27 kilograms per atomic mass unit, and we'll find um, that the mass defect is 1.6429 times 10 to the 28 kilograms. Okay, now that's not a, a large amount. Okay, so you'd be saying, okay, well, 
Um, that doesn't seem like it would translate into a large amount of energy, but according to the mass equivalency equation, the mass defect is there is then multiplied by the speed of light squared, which is a large number, you know, nine times 10 to the 16, basically. Okay, so that gives us 1.47 times 10 to negative 11 joules, uh, or 92 um, mega electron volts. And that's for one atom. Okay, so you can see where the, the energy is very high amount uh, when you start talking about, you know, millions of atoms or billions of atoms that may be involved in, um, you know, some kind of, of fusion or fission uh, reaction. Okay, so uh, here we see the binding energy per nucleon and it, uh, according to the mass number, you know, it's going up to hit a max around 56. Uh, as we spoke of earlier, and then it goes down. It actually goes up a lot more dramatically uh, before the 56, and therefore, you know, the fusion reactions would indicate that they have a higher binding energy per nucleon, okay? And they would have, there's actually more of an energy potential there than the fission, uh, which is why the sun, you know, basically uses that. Now, we want to talk about artificial transmutation. Uh, in 1919, Rutherford's first to artificially transmute an element. Now, this was done by bombarding um, a nitrogen-14 nucleus with an alpha particle, which is a helium nucleus. Okay, and uh, what happened is it changed. Okay, so part of the helium nucleus stuck. Okay, um, and you ended up changing the nitrogen into oxygen. And this was the first experimental proof of protons. Um, because you were left with a hydrogen atom at the end of it. Okay. Rutherford used radioactive isotopes, but today we use particle accelerators. Um, every atom larger than uranium is a result of this process. So uranium is the largest naturally occurring element and all of the ones after that are uh, artificial. Okay, that is um, uh, like a particle accelerator, okay, that are used for uh, smashing atoms together. That's another name that they sometimes call them atom smashers, but particle accelerator is the actual term. Now fission, uh, now fission is splitting in the nucleus, it releases tremendous energy. It was discovered in 1938 when Fermi shot low energy neutrons at uranium. Okay, uh, he goofed up. He's a silly guy. He was trying to create element 93, but ended up dividing the atom into roughly two equal parts. And uh, no, he didn't die doing this. Um, this is not radioactive decay, okay? Because radioactive decay is uh, a spontaneous, naturally occurring um, action. Fission is not naturally occurring and is not spontaneous. It is something that is induced, okay? So here you can see there's a neutron being shot at the uranium nucleus, and it causes it to split, okay? Now, interestingly, only slow-moving neutrons will do this. If the neutron is going too fast, it will not cause a split. Okay, I, th I found this kind of weird, but that is the way it is. Uh, but notice also that during this fission process, you have the release of three new neutrons plus energy. Okay. Uh, and that would be the energy that drives, you know, nuclear fission reactors, etc. Um, but because one neutron initiates the process and it produces three neutrons that can now initiate their own processes, this can set up, um, you know, a chain reaction where you can get uh, a sustained reaction, which is why nuclear fission uh, is sustainable. 
Okay, the calculation for this is the same as for nuclear binding energy equals mc squared. Some of the mass is lost as energy, the mass defect. And there uh, are also neutrons released which start a chain reaction of nuclear fission reactions. So uncontrolled nuclear fission reactions can give you a nuclear bomb. All right, so if you get a bunch of, um, you know, visible material all being bombarded by neutrons at the same time, then you get a chain reaction which causes a, a big kaboom, earth shattering kaboom. All right, so, but you can also control those reactions and uh, that gives you, you know, nuclear power stations. So here's an example of the chain reaction. So you've got the one neutron fizzing, um, causing a fission event, the fission products, but then you've got three which are firing off there and they're oh, producing their own fission uh, events. So fission, fission, fission all the way down. And at the end, you've got even more neutrons flying around. So this can happen, you know, quite quickly, which is why, you know, explosion type of things can happen. Uh, fission reactions do produce radioactive isotopes, which can cause alpha, beta, and gamma radiation. Okay, so that's why the, you know, nuclear waste is, uh, you know, dangerous. Um, but you can also, you know, people have been using it for all sorts of things. Uh, a lot of products of nuclear plants are actually used for um, radioactive tracing um, isotopes used in medical fields, okay? And so um, there are useful radioactive products, uh, but then there's also waste products that are, are then, um, you know, buried. But more um, modern reactors, breeder reactors, can actually use the waste products from a first um, fission event and do subsequent fission events so that they, they end up with much less waste at the end of it. That's a kaboom, the nursery iron kaboom. It's a big one. Okay, so, yeah, avoid that. Nuclear power, that's a good thing. Okay, so basically a, a nuclear generator is how it works. You've got, uh, you know, your confinement shell, but in your reactor core, uh, you've got the control rods, but you've got visible material there. Okay, and the visible material, you know, uranium of some sort or per perhaps plutonium. Uh, it all depends on the reactor. But um, they will uh, undergo the reaction. Now, the control rods help control how fast the reaction because you don't want it happening too fast or the earth shattering. Kaboom, right? So the control rods help uh, decrease the amount of neutrons that are uh, going through. Now you also got the core which is filled with water. The water gets heated up. Uh, you have steam produced which runs the steam turbine and then you know electric generation occurs and then the water gets condensed and kind of recycled back into the reactor. Okay, and there's a pump in the heat exchangers. Um, now the core, if you dump the water out of the core, the, the water slows down neutrons. Okay, so theoretically, if you dump the core, the water out of the core, then you no longer have slow-moving neutrons, which means that a fission reaction um, should be stopped. Okay, but if it's, if, if it's a runaway core, sometimes this won't work. But this is one of the safety precautions. And very few times has there been runaway cores. Uh, Chernobyl, you might remember, um, Three Mile Island. So relatively rare. Okay, fusion. So nuclear fusion involves the fusing of small nuclei. This is the process that happens in the sun to produce this energy. Uh, extremely high temperatures are required for fusion. Uh, so try like one times 10 to the eight degrees uh, Kelvin or so. Okay, uh, so it's got to be that way because the nuclei are both positive and need high kinetic energy to get that close. Okay, so you're you're taking positive nuclei, so there's a, the repulsive electrostatic force that has to be overcome for those those nuclei then to fuse and then uh, you know release energy. 
So here's a, a typical reaction. You get deuterium and tritium, which are basically isotopes of uh, hydrogen. Okay, so it's like hydrogen with, with um, you know, two or three um, mass. So hydrogen with, with one or two neutrons attached to it. But then you put them together and you will create helium and a neutron, basically. All right. And a bunch of energy. Uh, so nuclear fusion powers the sun. So here you can see uh, different ways this fusion can happen. If you just have regular hydrogen atoms, you can get fusion. Uh, it's more likely if you've got uh, deuterium and tritium. Um, okay. But sometimes you can have deuterium and regular hydrogen. Or here they also show two helium nuclei reacting. Uh, which is not the normal thing. Well, isotopes of helium, not a regular helium nuclei. Okay. So the most normal, if you want to call it that, uh, common fusion reaction it would be the deuterium and tritium producing, uh, you know, helium. And that concludes our.